Okay, let's open up our Bibles this morning to uh, the Gospel of Matthew. And I've been reading here a, a little bit on the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, but I want to read uh, chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew a little bit here and there, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Today's society would like to have the blessings of God. They would like to have the things of God, but without God. They would like to have it, but without God. Today, the new morality is, let's make our own morals, let's have our own humanistic morals without God. And I got to tell you something, it doesn't work. Because every time you make some kind of law and you don't include God in it, you have a catastrophe that creates another law, that creates another law, that creates another law, and then you have all kinds of problems with it. And it's all because of that reprobate mind, that rebellion against God. I don't want to do what God says. I have never found in my years the uh, animosity against God as I have found today. That people are so uh, tuned to fight against the things of God. You know, the Bible says that in the last day that the devil would stir up the people. He'd stir them up. And they would march against God. And I can, I, you know, I always thought, how could anybody want to follow the devil? But we have a crowd of people today who are determined to follow the dictates of the devil. They would rather serve the devil than to serve God. They would rather be loyal to satanic things than to be loyal to the things of God. And yet they look and say, I want those blessings. I want those. I want to have a good life. I want to have peace in my life. I want to have tranquility in my life. I want to have all these things in my life. But without God, you cannot have those things in your life. You can have an imitation of them. Like we have people who have imitations today. Imitation chocolate. Imitation this and imitation that, you know. But not the real thing. And so this morning I'm going to read a little bit from the Sermon on the Mount, and I want you to just picture with me Jesus here with a group of people. In verse 1 and 2 it says, Seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now some people say that he taught his disciples. Some say he taught his disciples and the multitude. And I would like to say that the word went out and he did preach to many, many people that day. What a fantastic and marvelous uh, 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 a miracle to be able to speak and preach to a multitude of people. And uh, you know, you ever get yourself in a crowd of people and you start talking, if you're 25, 30 feet away, it seems like you can't hear nothing. Even if there's somebody at a, in a, a, up on a stage and he doesn't, his microphone goes dead, what happens? I, I, I don't hear, him. what's he saying, what's he saying? You can't hear what's going on. And yet, Jesus is with this multitude of people and he begins to speak and they heard what he had to say. And now let me uh, speak a little bit about the message that he gave. Remember that the Bible says that he came unto his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him. Now, now I want to emphasize on that one part, he came unto his own. This message basically is a message to the Jew. It's a message to those people who were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for some great gift of God. And so here he comes and brings this message to, the, to his own people. Today, we need to have the message preached to God's people. God's people need to be stirred up. Just as in that day, the people today have got to be stirred up. We've got to realize our uh, alliances. We've got to realize who our enemy is. We have to realize who it is that we're serving. We have to realize that God has a work and a motivation for each one of us, a, a path that he wants for us, a thing and a blessing for all of God's people. So look at verse 3, 4, 5. We'll read down. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
These are called the Beatitudes, and these are the blessings. The first and the most important blessing of these, I believe, like nine blessings here, uh, the most important is, number one is, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see that the terminology, the kingdom of heaven, was uh, significant to the Jew. The Jew understood the kingdom of heaven. The other scriptures and the other uh, gospels will use like the kingdom of God, where this is the kingdom of heaven. He's speaking directly to those Jewish people that were waiting for the Messiah. He's explaining to them about blessings. And a blessing is a, a fortunate thing that happens to you. It's something that sets you aside or something that makes you happy. Uh, uh, something that this blessing is something that comes to you and you're so happy to receive it. It's something you receive. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here is an analogy of what you have to do, how you have to live to receive this blessing. In this case, it is the kingdom of heaven. And we would like to all go into the kingdom of heaven. We have people today who say, ah, oh, there's no such thing as a kingdom of heaven. I don't, believe in the, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in any of that stuff. You know what? It doesn't matter one iota what they believe. It's who God is that counts. And God is, has a city. God has a city prepared for his people. God has a place for his people. And it is in the kingdom of heaven. It is in that economy of the kingdom of heaven. And to become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, the first step is to be poor in spirit, lacking humble spirit of man that needs to come into the kingdom of heaven. And if you're poor in spirit, God will richly bless you and bring you into the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for theirs they shall be comforted. Is, here is those that mourn, and uh, mourning uh, for what? What are you mourning for? Is it mourning for your lost loved ones? I don't think this is what Jesus was talking about here. Unfortunately, for the carnal-minded uh, of the church even, who think that when they go to a funeral and they're mourning and they're, they're feeling depressed over, over the loss of a loved one, they're thinking, oh, well, uh, I'm going to be blessed. God is going to bless me because I'm mourning. That's not what it means. This is talking about mourning over your sins, crying over those things in your life that you need to have changed and that only God can change those things. And when you begin to mourn toward God and you begin to ask God, Lord, I'm sorry for the sins that I've committed. Lord, I'm so sorry, and I'm, I'm, just so, uh, I'm just so taken by those things. And Lord, I want you to take those things out of my life. When you begin to mourn for those things, God will comfort you because Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see that God has a plan for those that mourn over their sins. God has a salvation for them. God has a way for them that they can be comforted. And how comforting is it when we say, I have life. I have found life. There's a song that says, I have found a friend in Jesus and he's everything to me. Isn't that wonderful? And isn't it comforting when we can say that we found that friend in Jesus and that the morning that we cried over our sins and the things that we did, you know, that remember he was talking to the Jewish people here. You want Messiah? You want something good in your life? You need to repent of your sins. You need to get right with God. You need to get on the right path and the right trail. And, uh, and when that happens, then God will bless you abundantly. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, I, mean, I can't even read this verse without thinking about Moses. The Bible says he was the meekest man in all the earth. And uh, I'm sure that to the Jewish people, 
uh, when they heard the word meek, that they would immediately think of Moses and think of the laws of Moses and the commandments of Moses and the things that Moses brought to those people. And here Jesus is saying to them, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Here is this message to bring and to shake their memories of their past and what God had promised them in the past and what God has said for you and me, that if we are meek toward God, that God would allow us to inherit the earth. The Bible says that, that we would live on this earth, you know. And God made Adam and Eve, and he set them in this beautiful garden, you know. And uh, uh, what, was the, what was the end of that? What was the, what was the plan of that when we think about it? And I, I think, you know, that God told Adam and Eve before they ate of the forbidden fruit, he told them to be fruitful and multiply so that God, while he, had, while he had put them in a garden, I want you to look at this now, God had put them in the garden, but God had expected them to grow into a city. They were going to grow into a city because he wanted them to be fruitful and to multiply. And you see, God's end plan was the city. God wanted them to to go into the city, to become a city. But God has a city for us. God has a plan for us to live in the city, and we will inherit the earth. In the end, those that love God, those that care about him, we will live in that city. The Bible says that God has a new Jerusalem, a new city. It's coming down, see? So right from the beginning... Well, God had this plan, although it started in the garden, it was destined or designed to become a city, a great people, a great people of God. And what happened? What happened? The devil come along and tempted Eve. She ate of the fruit. She gave it to her husband. He ate of the fruit, and they spread out into the countryside. No city. The first city that was built, by the way, was from, uh, was from uh, a murderer built the first city, and he uh, uh, had that uh, uh, place, uh, I think the city was Enoch, wasn't it, that God, that he had built, uh, it, it meant that idea of Enoch, and so he built that city, and it wasn't in the plan of God that he should build that city. It, it was Abraham's, or I mean, excuse me, Adam's descendants through those that loved God should have built that city, but they didn't. If there had not been sin, they would have built the city, but they didn't. So God had another city. And in the end of the age, we shall inherit the earth. Not the unsaved, not Cain and his followers, but God's people will inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I... When I see this, uh, you know that sometimes we're so hungry after the things of this life and we expect the blessing of God. We, accept, we expect God will give us those good things that we want or that we desire in this life and yet the flesh is desiring for those things outside of the will of God and outside of the things of God. The, wo the war that we have with the flesh is real. That we... Uh, uh, we don't. We struggle against those desires that we have, and against those things of the flesh. And anybody who tells me, "Well, since I got saved, I don't have any trouble with the flesh anymore," I would say, "You're probably dead. You're probably not alive." I'm listening to a a recording someplace because we are struggling against those things. Even the Apostle Paul said that I struggle against those things that I, I don't, I shouldn't do, but I have, I don't want, but I, ooh, 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 and we get into that, you know. But here, look what it says. It says that, here it says that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So what is this righteousness? What is it? Is it our own righteousness? It is the righteous, is it a self-righteousness? It is, is it the righteousness of the world? The world, you know, is trying to build a righteousness. They have hate laws. 
they have laws. They had a new law come out just today. It was in the paper about uh, uh, these college campuses that they they want. They have a law on uh, a sexual law against uh, a man uh, approaching a woman, on, and she has the right not to say no. She has to say yes. If she says yes, then it's okay. But you see, the morality of this law, this is not righteousness. This is a law where they, they took God out of the schools and they thought, well, okay, oh, whoa, we took God out of the school. Uh oh, look what we got over here. Whoa, we got a, we got a menagerie of, of problems over here. Okay, let's address this one. We'll make a law. And then another problem comes up. Oh, let's do this. Oh, let's have this law. Let's have that law. And all of these laws are brought up because they took God out. They, they want some type of self-righteousness. And there is only one righteousness, and that's the righteousness of God. And that if we hunger after that righteousness. Now, what is this righteousness? In the scripture, it translates out to mean a right standing with God. Having that ability or having that grace of God that we are actually able to communicate with him and that he communicates with us and that he becomes our friend. The best example of that would be Abraham. The Bible says that he was the friend of God and God was his friend. Can you imagine? that God desires and wishes that all of us to become the friend of God. And if we are the friend of God, then we have the righteousness of God. It doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we can't sin or, or that we're, we're a, a goody two-shoes or something. It means that we have an avenue or a way. The Bible says in 1 John, it says that if we sin, we have an advocate that we can go to him and we can repent and ask him to forgive us of our sins. The Bible says that if we ask for forgiveness of sin, that he will wash us with his blood and cleanse us and make us right. So God is there all the time. God has a continual washing us day by day as we go through this life. And we can have that relationship with him. We need to hunger and thirst for that relationship and that righteousness of God so that we can be filled with the Spirit of God. The Apostle Paul says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God, that God wishes to fill us? We're not going to be hungry for uh, 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 salami sandwiches. We're, hung we're hungering and thirst for a righteousness of God. Amen? All right, so then we look at verse 7. It says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You know, uh, it wasn't God's people who took the golden rule off the ruler. If you buy rulers today, they took the golden rule off the rulers. Do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. Oh, no, we can't have that. That's from the Bible. We can't have that. But it's a truth that whether it's written on that ruler or not, it is a truth that we have to live by. That if we are merciful toward others, that God will show mercy to us. He tells us that uh, little parable about the man who owed money, you know. And you remember that story that the man owed money and he, he came to his... Uh, uh, he came to uh, the person that he owed the money to and he says, have mercy on me, have mercy on me and I will pay you. Give me a chance to go to those that owe me money. I'll get the money and I'll come back and I'll pay you the money. So what does he do? He goes to someone who owes him money and he has him thrown in prison and whipped. And another one, he goes to another one and he, he, he's very harsh toward that one. Give me my money or you're going to jail. Back then they had a, a debtor's jail, you know. And uh, when the person that he owed money to heard it, he called him in. He says, hey, you're going to jail. I had mercy on you, but you don't have mercy on those that, you, that owed you money, you see. And so this, uh, how does this work? that 
there are always those in this life that give us a hard time. And so if we give them a hard time, what about the people that we give a hard time to? <laughs> oh, you say, well, I don't give anybody a hard time. Guess what? Guess what? <laughs> Nobody's perfect. And we all offend in one way or the other. Well, I, I, you know, I know. But I'm not going to say anything about it. But there are those that maybe think they're perfect, huh? But we all offend in one way or another. We always have some way that we offend. And so that we have to have mercy on uh, others that we might obtain this mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, how can you be pure in heart? How can you receive the blessing of having a pure heart? There's only one way. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, it says that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Woo! It's wicked. But how can I have a pure heart? There's no way that any person can do anything, can, can, can make some type of sacrifice in his life that he could obtain a pure heart. There's no way to do it. But God has said that he would sprinkle our heart with pure water. And when he sprinkles our heart with that pure water, then we can have a clean and a pure heart. And it is only with the washing of water in our life and that repentive spirit that God wants us to have that we could end up with a pure heart. A pure heart is not a perfect heart in the sense that, well, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm uh, uh, not like other people. I don't sin and this and that and the other. That subject came up the other day talking with somebody and they talked, was speaking about, uh, can a Christian sin? Well, the Bible says, he that sinneth is of the devil. That's a good, boy, that's a, that's a really hard one, huh? Because then, uh, well, one person says, I don't sin anymore. And uh, say, uh, the other person said, well, how can that be? Because we all, we're sinners, we all sin, see? But I use the example that, that uh, we uh, may sin, but we don't practice sin. There's a, that word that says, he that sinneth is of the devil. That word sinneth is the word iniquity. It's a word that means continually sin, continually sinning. So we don't have an attitude of continual sinning. It means that we may sin, but we don't purposely go get up every morning with a purpose of sinning. It's like our world today. Our world has many people in it that they want us to condone their sins. We want, they want to, us to say, they want the church to say, it's okay to live that lifestyle. It's okay to have that personality and that lifestyle. It's good. They want us to to approve of their uh, wickedness. And, and if uh, they continue to live in that sin and live in that lifestyle, they are practicing sin. They're practicing it. They're doing it. They're continually doing it. They have an attitude of, I'm right, I'm going to do this no matter what. We just recently had a Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, I go, ooh, Supreme Court. The Supreme Court decided that same-sex marriage was okay, okay? There's only one court higher than the Supreme Court, and that is the court of God's word, the court of law, God's throne, where God has already told us through his word that that is a wicked, wicked thing. And I just, just let me uh, read uh, one scripture for those who might be listening by TV and might be wondering, because I have people say, what is wrong with uh, having that uh, uh, attitude or that lifestyle? What's wrong with it? Is there anything wrong with it? Romans chapter 1, and I would say to those people that they should really read Romans chapter 1 without having the uh, uh, interpreter... Uh, uh, mongrel interpreters come and try to tell you that it's something else, that it doesn't apply for today. But look what it says here in Romans chapter 1, 
Uh, for this cause, verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Uh, some people ask me, they say, what does natural mean? What is natural? Natural in the natural sense that God created man and woman. Jesus said it is that uh, when, uh, two, when a couple get married, it says that the the man leaves his family, his mother and his father, and he cleaves to his wife. He doesn't cleave to another man. He doesn't cleave to a husband. He must cleave to his wife. The wife is a feminine term so that there is a relationship in marriage between a man, one man, and one woman. But here it says that uh, in verse 26, even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, 27. And likewise also, men leaving the natural use of the woman, leaving the natural use of the woman. That's natural. Burning in their lusts, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was met. In other words, that they turned away from the natural God-given marriage, one man, one woman, and they burned in their lusts man and man. Let's get back to the blessings. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. To have a pure heart, you have to change your attitude toward the world. You have to change your attitude against your own thoughts of what you think is right and wrong and begin to look upon what God says is right and wrong. That's what Paul said when he wrote the Romans. He was talking about that which was natural and that which is unnatural, of course. And so if we want to have a pure heart, only the things of God, when the word of God begins to wash us, all right? Not when the world begins to wash us. Not when the majority of the people begin to wash us. Not when the thinkers in this world begin to wash us. But when, let me do one more. Not when the protesters begin to wash us. But when the word of God begins to wash us, we can become pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Can't have a spirit of, that we always want to fight with somebody here. We want to have uh, yeah, a peacemaker, yeah, become a peacemaker. Then we'd be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I believe this persecution is been going on in other countries. Look at what happened in the Middle East, how these Muslim people are uh, uh, cutting off the heads of Christian people. What is the crime that they've committed, these Christians? What have they committed? They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in God. And for that crime against them, they are beheaded. But they're in good company because John the Baptist was beheaded. They're in good company because Paul the Apostle was beheaded. And so God has a great blessing for these martyrs, and we need to pray for their families, we need to pray for them, that they are, the, they are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And this is what's going to happen in the Christian church, even in America, that uh, they got a term now, it's called homophobic. Homophobic is a, is, a, is a slap back at you, saying that you fear the homosexual. You fear them. You fear them. What a foolish, foolish uh, uh, phrase to bring against God's people because God's people are fearless against the 
wiles of the enemy. And even if they do these things and they want to come against us with all types of things, God is going to be the victor in the end. You remember the story, and I, I mentioned this a few uh, weeks ago, about how that uh, uh, Daniel and his friends were taken into Babylon, and uh, a great uh, uh, image was uh, put up, and the king, Nebuchadnezzar, said that he wanted everyone to bow before the image, and he wanted them to uh, 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 do praise unto this image, you know? Today we have the image of uh, homosexuality, of, of, uh, of all types of other things that are going on in this world, and the country, the nation, wants us to bow before it. They want us to accept it. They want us to, to embrace it. They want us to be happy with it. Huh? Just as Nebuchadnezzar said concerning his image. Just bow before it. When you hear the trumpets blow, bow before it. And there were three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And uh, they would not bow before the image. Now, there was a lot of people taken, you know, but it just mentions those three. They would not bow. And they were brought before the king, and the king says, I'm going to give you an opportunity to bow before the image. Just as I believe that's going to happen, it's happening right now in our country, where men are being forced, in a sense, they're being forced, you, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna knuckle under. You're going to bow. You're going to do what we want you to do. And he said, if you don't bow before the image, I'm going to throw you in a fiery furnace. And they says, oh, king, live forever. I say to, uh, I say to uh, this nation, who is a great nation, go on, live, do what you're going to do. God is going to bring you down. I'm not going to bring you down. And, uh, and uh, they said, oh, king, live forever, but know this, king, that we will not bow before your image. And God is able to deliver us from your fiery furnace. But if God does not deliver us from your fiery furnace, if you're going to tax us, if you're going to take our churches away, if you're going to do all those things against us, know this, that we will not surrender the word of God. We will not give up on what God's word says. We're going to stand fast in the word of God. Come what may. And so the king got so furious, the nation is going to get so furious against those who believe in God and believe in his word. And we see uh, incidences of it. We hear it on the internet. We hear it how people revile and hate the word of God so much. There's a, uh, uh, there's a movement in the south just recently to remove the Confederate flag from the Capitol building down in, uh, in uh, North Carolina, was it, or South Carolina. And I want to say that if you watch closely what was going on, there is a consensus that now they got this group of people who wiped their fannies with the American flag and with the Confederate flag and with the pages of Bibles, they're wiping their fanny and throwing it out at people. Okay? And so what is that all about? It is, a, it is such an indignation, a protest against the Word of God, against anything that is civil or anything that, is, that brings any kind of other than anarchy, uh, anarchy where uh, they're against anything that uh, uh, takes away from their thinking or their, what they want. They're offended by it. They're offended by the flag. They're offended by the Bible. They're offended by these things. Nebuchadnezzar was offended against those three Hebrew children. Make that furnace hot, he says. Make it hot. He says, hotter than you've ever made it before. And they burned that fire, and they made it seven times hotter than they normally would. Those ovens were used to bake bread, not men. And so they had that big fire going, and the king's men took those three Hebrew children and threw them into the fiery furnace. The fire was so hot, when those who were throwing them in got near the fire to throw them in, 
They perished. They died just outside of the fiery furnace. There were those that had died bringing them into the fire. And the king, oh, throw them in. If it means your life, you throw them in. And there are those today, they will sacrifice their own life. They used to have a saying, they would cut off their nose to spite their face. And we have those today in society who are so wicked and so bad that they don't care if it means their own death that they're going to have their own way. We have a term in the scripture, it's called a reprobate, a reprobate mind, that they don't care what happens to them. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. And they threw the Hebrew children into the fiery furnace. And the King Nebuchadnezzar, he's from afar looking into the furnace. And there's a white flame in there, so hot. And yet he sees four in the fiery furnace. He sees four. He says, did not we throw three into the fiery furnace? I see four. And one is as the Son of God. In the fiery furnace. How did he know about the Son of God? How did he know? It was a term that meant it was, the, uh, it was an angel or it was something of God in the fiery furnace. When we go through the fiery furnace today, and we may have to go through it. Those people in the Middle East who love the Lord, who have made a confession of faith concerning Jesus Christ, are going through a fiery furnace right now. There was a woman on the TV the other day. Her husband is being held in Iran. He's a minister of the gospel. And they asked her, they says, well, uh, the, we know that this has been a terrible struggle for you, uh, uh, that your husband has been held like this, and you haven't seen him for a long time. How are you holding up? And she says, this fiery trial has increased my faith in God and my love for Jesus Christ. Wow, what a tremendous witness before the world she gave concerning her faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful? So that when things begin to happen and we begin to get uh, frustrated over these things, let's not worry. Jesus said in verse 12, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost his savor, wherein shall it be salted? It is therefore, henceforth, good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Hold up to what God has put into your life, that you are the salt of the earth. Don't lose that savor of the salt. Don't lose it. Because men need it. It is a healing balm for all men. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill, and it cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Hold up, stand up, and God will bless you. God will give you something great. But don't give in to the wiles of the devil. Don't give in to the thoughts of, oh, if, if, I, if, I don't, if I don't bow before the image of the nation, if I don't bow before it, oh, oh, I'm, I'm going to lose my, I'm going to lose everything that I have. They're going to tax me. They're going to they're going to make me uh, uh, they're going to make me look like I, I, I'm a I, I'm a, a troublemaker. They're going to do something against me. Hold fast, hold fast. All of the troublemakers, in that sense, all of the troublemakers are going to be with God. Amen. Let's stand and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Let's stand and we'll have a word of prayer at this time. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for, again, this opportunity to, that, to present the word of God, Lord, to one another here. And Lord, as we go out with this message to this community, Lord, next week this will go out. And we pray, Lord, that the power of God 
by the Spirit of God would go out with it. Lord, that it would touch the hearts of those who hear it, we pray. And Lord, if there's anyone who hears this message and they want to become one with you and they want that righteousness, Lord, touch their hearts, Lord, that they might begin to mourn over their sins and that they might receive you as their Savior and their, mas and your mas and their Master. Lord, help us, Lord, that we might live a life that's pleasing to you. Do those things that are pleasing in your sight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. And so we meet here Sunday morning at 11, uh, 10 o'clock, and we uh, visit the church in Shiloh, uh, the church Shiloh on uh, Kirkville Road and Fremont Road, Wednesday night at 7, Sunday night at 7. We'd like to meet you there. And uh, uh, until we see you again, remember that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, Jesus said. Amen. Praise the Lord.